Welcome to another episode of Authentic Falconer. You're watching Trevor Jahangard. Perfect. And he is a uh, fellow YouTuber. He's got a lot of great content out there. And uh, I hope you guys can check out his stuff as well. But he is a falconer and um, he's done a lot of videos, intro videos with his uh, goshawk and with his Cooper's hawk. And he just gets into real good detail. And I thought it'd be a great idea to uh, have a chat with him and maybe he could help us go through some things that maybe weren't covered in the videos and also just a little bit more background of how he became in, to become a falconer. So yeah. first of all, thanks for coming out here, Trevor. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. It's well, nice, nice getting to see you. Not coming out here, letting me come to you. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, I appreciate you letting us, you know, get an insight of your life. And, you know, just wanted to start with your falconry career. How did that really come about? Yeah, so I, uh, I found out about falconry in high school. I, um, I was one of those kids that always loved, you know, rescuing animals. I had the baby squirrels and anything, lizards, anything I could get my hands on. And so in high school, I went to a, a magnet high school, a satellite high school, North Hollywood High School. And there's a school in the parking lot of the LA Zoo. And so for, you know, my 10th or 11th and 12th grades, I was, I was fully in the parking lot of the LA Zoo for classes. And there was an elective class where you were a student keeper. And so I got to go and work for, you know, that elective period at the bird show. Mm -hmm. And so I found out, I mean, I got to work with a bunch of things. Mostly I was just cleaning cages. Um, but I found out that falconry was a thing. And the, the lead trainer at the bird show was a falconer. And he ended up becoming my sponsor. And kind of the rest was history from there. But I started falconry when I was about 15 years old. I remember not being able to drive and my mom driving me to my sponsor's house initially. Uh -huh. So I started pretty young, but uh, it, that's how I got into it. Nice. Did you yeah. have to convince your parents on any end or were they all for it? You know what? They were, they were great. They let me, you know, have snakes and birds and all kinds of stuff in the house. And uh, when I told them about the falconry thing, they were a little surprised about the hunting part, mm -hmm. but they were, they were a game. I mean, at the time I had uh, 50 pairs of lovebirds that I was breeding Whoa. in our backyard in an aviary. So they were, uh -huh. they were very okay. cool with me having lots of birds. I had a Myers parrot and a, a Senegal and a cockatoo and cockatiels and mm -hmm. lots of birds. Yeah. So and you set uh, the tone real early with them that yeah. you're probably going to have more birds in the future. Yeah. So. And, cool. and my dad had uh, chickens and pigeons. Okay. So he was very comfortable. The whole family was comfortable with birds. And so, yeah, when I, you know, found out about the falconry thing, I, got a red tailed hawk as an apprentice and got rid of every other bird that I had, except for the cockatoo. I kept the cockatoo for a while, but every <laughs> other bird I got, I, I didn't get rid of them. I found good homes for them and, and I yeah. sold the love birds. That's I was sure raising. Did. Of course them, you did. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then I, yeah, I found falconry and it was kind of just falconry from there on in. So nice. they were, they were great. They were very understanding. So um, you're right next to the zoo and you get your, your sponsor from, basically school. Uh -huh. um, did you actually work with him at the zoo? I mean, how was the training as far as like when you first got started? I did. Yeah. So when I first started, I was in high school and I was only going there a couple of times a week in the morning, helping them clean cages. But then uh, outside of that, he had me you know, studying for the exam and I took the exam. I passed it. I started building the muse, getting all the equipment together. And on the weekends, Early on, my mom would drive me to his house, and then I got my license, my driver's license, <laughs> and uh, I was able to drive there. So I'd go on the weekends, and I'd go hunting with him and um, you know, help him clean his mews and take care of his birds. He had a lot of birds. He was doing abatement at the time. And so I got a lot of uh, that experience in, and then I, after graduating high school, I went to the exotic animal training uh, management program here in Moore Park at Moore Park oh. Community College. It's basically a, a zoo at a college where you learn to train animals for two years. It's a, a two year intensive six day a week program. And so I was working with baboons and they happen to have a Harris hawk and a bald eagle and a golden eagle. So I was working with them okay. as well, but also camels and uh, servals and mountain lions, like all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and while I was doing that, I was uh, learning falconry and I was a an apprentice falconer. And once I graduated from that program after high school, the two-year program, I started working at the LA Zoo and I worked at the bird show for seven years part-time. Okay. And so I learned falconry uh, while I was also learning animal training. And then I also worked at the bird show 
and it's a free flight bird show and I got to work with everything there, harpy eagles, crowned eagles, um, African fish eagles, wow. Japanese hawk eagles, uh, stellar sea eagles, bald eagles. Um, John was pretty funny. John Gunther was my sponsor mm-hmm. and he had been a falconer for a very long time at that point. And he was very comfortable with aggressive birds and it's hard to find flighted eagles Mm -hmm. Uh, to use for bird shows and so if he found uh, a zoo that was trying to get rid of their eagles because they were aggressive but they could fly he would get them Mm -hmm. and so I kind of cut my teeth early on in my falconry career and my zoo training career with pretty aggressive bald eagles and and African crowned eagles and harpy eagles but there was also macaws and parrots and lanner falcons and kestrels and road runners and all kinds of different things so Mm -hmm. I I I really learned about training in the classical animal training sense and operant conditioning and clicker training and um, sort of teaching birds show type behaviors, but it really helped my falconry and it shaped my falconry as well. Very cool. I've yeah. heard that the, um, like the sea eagles and like the bald eagles, all those types of eagles are very, um, they have attitudes. They're kind of hard to They do. It's that weird with. social sea eagle nature and they're very mouthy like bitey as well. So I grew my beard out a little bit. I always had sunglasses on. I got a lot of face bites, not that bad. Um, But it was an interesting way to sort of, you know, interact and learn with birds. And so Mm -hmm. after you have to go in and grab an upset harpy eagle or bald eagle that's, you know, trying to come after you, everything else seems easy. Like, you know, a a red tail is like cake. (laughs) So Uh, did you find that if you were more afraid like before you saw something coming, they would be more aggressive or, you know, when dealing and handling them, when you knew what to expect a little bit, especially the Eagles, they have, they have more of that social response, like as opposed to a goshawk or a Cooper's hawk. Mm -hmm. Um, and so the Eagles, if you didn't kind of like get yourself out there and just walk in into the room, like you owned it, Uh they'd pick up on it, but that you can't always like, you can't bowl them over. They, they will, you know, they, it's okay. not quite it's a, like it's a fine mammals. line. Yeah, yeah. There's a fine <laughs> line between being too, you know, strong with your presence and kind of, you know, making sure you don't overdo it. Sure. Uh, but I started off with red tails and then, uh, and then I graduated to American kestrels. Um, I, I call it a graduation cause the weight management was harder. Yeah. And then I was unlucky with my kestrels. Um, they, they both got grabbed by Cooper's hawks. And so I decided no more small birds because yeah. I put all this work into them and uh-huh. I'm hunting with them. And then a Cooper's hawk came and ruined it. And then after the kestrels, I, I had a couple Harris hawks. Um, and then I started working with Cooper's hawks and, and they've been the most difficult thing for me. Mm-hmm. So it was a lot of Cooper's hawks and then a sharp shinned hawk and then Giselle, the, the goss hawk that I've made pretty much all the videos about. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then I started working with rehab golden eagles. And so that's kind of been my falconry progression through the years that I've trained and then hunted with as well. Very nice. Um, yeah, yeah, I've seen the most of, you know, the videos on Giselle and her imprint training and all that good stuff. And we'll get into that too. Um, the, uh, the first red tail you had, yeah. Do you remember how your, how she, how she turned out or was there like any, there's always a good story. Yeah. And what's really funny is, yeah, my, my naming system, I just, I, I don't know if I'm not creative or what, but I just started with the alphabet. So I started with A. So her name was Annie. All right. (laughs) Annie the Red Tail. Uh And then I've been going through the alphabet. So um, what was my last bird? My last bird was um, Hannibal was the eagle and Ivan the Terrible. So you can see where in the alphabet I am. Uh And Giselle is G. Yeah. Um, So yeah, my first Red Tail, I... uh, you know, normal in terms of initial training and manning down and, you know, had her flying free in my backyard, had a telephone pole in my backyard. So she'd fly up to the telephone pole and come down to the lure. And I had another buddy who was an apprentice at the time as well, but he was a second year apprentice and he came and I had the bird for maybe five weeks. Oh yeah. And he, he saw her in my backyard and he said, she's ready to hunt. You gotta, you gotta <laughs> get her out feel there. Feel her keel or anything? No, no, no keel <laughs> feeling. No straight asking about it. weight. Just saw her in my backyard. Saw her come down from a telephone pole to a okay. rabbit lure, uh-huh. and said she's ready to go. So we went out and uh, we put her up on a pole in a hunting field. Tons of jackrabbits running underneath her, 
and she looks at the jackrabbits and she looks at me and she flies away. And so that was my, that was my very first hunt. That was my intro to falconry. And I, I got her back and she ended up being a, a great bird. Mm-hmm. Uh, but my sponsor was very big into, you know, let her go and get another one, do it again, repeat the training process. So you can okay. learn that part really well. And so that's what I ended up doing. I let her go. And then I got Bonnie, <clears throat> the, my second red tail. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, yeah. And then it was, you know, and she was great. And then it was Kestrels after that. And then a couple of Harris Hawks and then, and then Cooper's Hawks, Sharpshinned Hawk, Goss Hawk, Eagles it was kind of the trajectory I went on. Nice. Um, so uh, I don't know how the Eagles, I didn't even know you actually trained Eagles at all. So mm-hmm. was that a part of a rehab program where you, um, getting them ready to release yeah. them hunting again? Yeah, exactly. So, um, Tony Seferdini, he's local around here and it kind of my, I grew up in my falconry world with him being around and he has flown a lot of rehab Eagles, mm-hmm. uh, and him and Joe Atkinson have a, a program that they're working with or working on up in Sacramento with uh, a veterinarian, uh, veterinarian, Dr. Vicki Joseph. Oh, okay. And so out of this program, they get uh, golden eagles and they, you know, if it's an adult eagle and it has an injury and it's healed and it can fly, it's released. But if it's a young eagle right at that edge or that cusp of, you know, did they, did they get sick or injured before they actually learned how to hunt? Then they want to make sure they can hunt before they release them. Mm-hmm. And so they, um, they have this program set up and the Eagles go to Falconers and they make sure that they're hunting for a season. So, uh, first, you know, flying off the fist and, and catching jackrabbits and then making sure they can soar yeah. uh, for an hour or two. And then if you can hunt that way as well, you know, that, that kind of seals the deal. Once they're doing that, they're releasable and then they're released and then you get another one and then you train that one and, and then, you know, you release that one. And Tony's done this now. God, I don't know how many eagles he's had. I think he's had like 15, maybe more golden eagles that he's oh, done goldens. rehab work with and, yeah. and released. Yeah. I saw recently he posted something with a sea eagle catching a fish and bringing it and dropping it. Yeah. Like yeah. A retriever would. So he's a, he's a, a trainer and he trains, um, all kinds of animals, especially birds for movie and TV work. And I, I did that for a while too, a long time ago, um, after I graduated from that animal training program. And, um, he continued with, and that's, you know, what he does really as a, yeah. as a profession. And so he has an African fish Eagle right now. And he, he always has the coolest birds. He has an African crowned Eagle. He has some different vultures and he has some, uh, wedge tailed Eagles that he's working with. And mm-hmm. so it's, it's, it was always fun to be around him. And he's a really helpful person to call whenever I get stuck with something, mm-hmm. um, because he's trained, you know, Basically, if you name the bird, he, I think he's worked with it. He yeah. wouldn't say that, but he's trained a lot of different birds and even, you know, non-falconry birds just for movie and TV work. Mm-hmm. So it's been an interesting way to kind of come up in the falconry mm-hmm. community because the falconers I know also, you know, worked at the LA Zoo or they were, um, sh- you know, bird show trainers or they were movie or TV show trainers as well. And so I got to see and experience and work with a lot more variety of birds than you normally would in a in a general falconry experience. Very cool. I didn't know you did movie stuff. Was there, would there be any <clears throat> movies we would know of that? You I was, I wasn't really on set for any of the movies. I was helping train. So I did oh, a lot of commercials okay. like Budweiser commercials, uh, where which there was one? an elephant. There was, I don't remember which Super Bowl it was, but it was a Super Bowl ad and they had a, a giraffe and an elephant and bison and an ostrich and a kangaroo. And I was working with all those. I mean, with the elephant, all I was doing was like dragging around a trash can and, <laughs> and like it, on, it was on a dolly and just picking up poop, you know? Oh, okay. Because whenever the elephant would poop, you like, you got to get to it right <laughs> so away. So you were on a set. trainer? <laughs> I was the assistant trainer. Um, oh. But yeah, this was a, all these animals in the commercial were trying out to be the Clydesdale horses for Budweiser. Oh, I remember that one. Yeah. And so that was a commercial <clears throat> I worked on. And then I worked on a bunch of different TV shows, but mostly I was a freelance animal trainer helping a couple different animal training companies. Mm -hmm. And so I would mostly help them, um, not on set, but on their ranches. And then I would go on set as an assistant trainer, but I was never a lead trainer. I didn't have Mm -hmm. my own animal. Um, I had a Rhodesian Ridgeback for a while and he got a lot of commercials. He did a Ralph Lauren polo commercial and, Mm -hmm. um, it was like cologne stuff. 
And uh, he was on the IMS dog food bag for five years. Wow, that's and they, cool. And he was a really good looking Ridgeback, and they picked this really goofy picture of him. Uh-huh. Um, <laughs> just I was just like so devastated when they were like, "That's the picture we're going to put on the bag." Oh man, you got to show just, me. Like ears flopping, and um, <laughs> but yeah, so I did I did movie work and and mostly commercials and TV shows. Okay, um, as well when I was also working at the zoo, so I was part time zoo. Uh, part-time working at the bird show at the zoo, part-time doing TV, TV work with animal training on set. And it was, you know, raccoons and pigeons. And <clears throat> I don't know. It was everything, that a common sounds, buzzard and yeah. macaws, all kinds of stuff. It sounds wild. So why, I mean, how come you didn't pursue that as far as a career? Cause you kind of, you probably knew how everything went down as far as like the procedure and how to do everything. If you're behind the scenes and training. Yeah. And- yeah. Um, it's a good question. I, it, it was really fun to be on set and I did a commercial once. It was like a PSA for forest fires with Arnold Schwarzenegger uh-huh. and, uh, you know, nice. I had a Eurasian Eagle <laughs> owl on the set and it ended uh-huh. up just, it was a, just a picture they took and there was a small commercial. Um, and was it was Arnold, really, was he there? He was there. Yeah, yeah. he was there. Awesome. He was, um, he wasn't as big as I thought he'd be. I mean, I'm, really? I'm not big. Um, yeah. But I have an older were fle- brother. Were you flexing on him or what? No, not I was not even attempting. And he was the governor at the time. Oh, okay. When this was happening, yeah. you know. Um, but my I have a an older brother, and I was like, oh, he's kind of just his size. But really, but Arnold Arnold's great, and uh, the commercial was great. But yeah, I I found that I really enjoyed the training, but I didn't enjoy as much being on set and working with the the directors and the the actors. No offense to the actors, but it was. Yeah. Um, you know, it was, you really had to do what you needed to do to get the shot and that's totally fine. But I just was a little more particular and, you know, I'd like to take my time to train the animal to do what I wanted. And, um, there was a, a funny story. I was on set once and we were shooting in a neighborhood mm-hmm. and I think the commercial was, it was like, want to get away. I forgot what it was for. I think it was an airline commercial okay. and it was my dog. Uh, my Rhodesian Ridgeback was in this commercial. And the director wasn't quite getting, getting what he wanted with an iguana. There was an iguana. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and, um, and there was some people, some neighbors watching next door and they had their dog there. And, you know, we asked them to like, leave and we had to make sure that the set was safe. And he said, why? It's just a dog. It's fine. And we we're like, yeah, but it's not a trained dog. And so he was trying to get these shots and it, he was having a hard time. He wasn't quite getting what he wanted. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, then it was my dog's turn to like do his part. Yeah. And, um, and he, he was complaining a bit. And he's like, my dog could do this stuff. I should have just brought my dog. Oh, gosh. Because um, he was asking for things that we didn't have time to train. Mm-hmm. And then, um, you know, my dog gets up there. And my dog had to run down the street and on cue. And um, luckily, my dog was really good at that. And I trained him really well. And yeah. he nailed it. And, and the director, after I had given him a little bit of, like, lip earlier, mm-hmm. he was like, Who's, whose dog was that? They did really good. And I was like, that was my dog. <laughs> and I realized after that, like, I just, um, I have a hard time dealing with egos. Deal- yeah. And like <laughs> I have, sometimes I'd say, I say the obvious thing and it's not always good to do that on set to a director. So, um, gotcha. I realized it just wasn't for me when it was an amazing opportunity and you get to travel and being on set was, was really fun sometimes, but mm-hmm. I wanted to train animals more, um, sort of on my own terms and my yeah. own time. Oh, no, that makes sense. Sure. <clears throat> and so, I kind of pursued that, you know, at the bird show at the zoo. And then I had an opportunity to, to be on a falconry TV show that was being pitched to discovery channel. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so I picked up and I moved to Indiana for a year and I I tried to make that happen. Yeah. And I wasn't going to be on camera. I'm like, I'm not the camera personality person. I was just there to kind of help make this thing happen or try to make this thing happen. Mm -hmm. And so when I got there, you know, we, we filmed a sizzle reel, and it didn't get picked up or at least the first round they said no we need to tweak some things and so every time we'd send in this sizzle reel of what the show could be they would send feedback and it kept turning more and more into like duck dynasty where it was sort of scripted and they just wanted wacky things so they started having the the falconer of the tv show take his his bird to the theater and rent a corvette and have it in like a top-down corvette and like you know, his wife would get upset with him wanting the hawk at the dinner table sitting on the back of a chair. And it like, it just uh, turned into something that I, I didn't really want to be a part of because the original idea was great. The original idea was um, learn about falconry in a country, learn about the history of falconry, what birds they use, the techniques of training they use, the tradition, 
um, and then maybe see some hunting and then, yeah. and then go to different countries around the world. Yeah. That would have been a great show. It, it would have been, <laughs> awesome. been awesome. And that's what I was hoping for. And it didn't uh -huh. turn into that. So I gave it a year and, um, when I came back, I realized I didn't, I didn't want to jump right back into the zoo. I, I wasn't feeling fulfilled with what I wanted to do. And I was really getting into sustainability and, um, regenerative agriculture. And so I ended up, uh, getting a permaculture certificate and learning about permaculture and permaculture design and getting into farming. And so I've been a farmer for the last seven years, um, at a farm, Apricot Lane Farms, and we had a movie come out called The Biggest Little Farm, and it's all about regenerative ag. And so that's really been what I would say is my calling. Um, but falconry was always a part of my life. It was just, you know, my after work hobby. Um, yeah. But I, I wasn't quite into falconry as much as, you know, the, the guys that I know and grew up around and that I relied upon for that, that information when I, whenever I couldn't figure something out. Um, they moved to places specifically so they could hunt birds. And for me, falconry was always, it was like work and then falconry. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how we got there, but that was a very long uh, answer to no, probably was, a very short question. That was good. Um, that actually leads into what I was going to ask you, like how you got to, we're on a ranch right now and you're basically, you live here mm -hmm. and work here and you have hunting fields here. So you're kind of in the falconer's dream as far as wake up, go out the door, go hunting. Yeah. Yeah. I, so I got really lucky. I ended up on a 214 acre farm and, um, I, I hacked Giselle on the farm and I had to end the hack because she caught a chicken <laughs> and that was, that was a no, no. So I think, I think she was at hack, um, for 31 days. And then after she grabbed that chicken, it kind of had to end the hack. But, um, what's great is my neighbor and on our property as well, there's a lot of rabbits, um, there's unfortunately a lot of ground squirrels, mm -hmm. um, but there's, there's so much game around here that I, I literally can just like walk out my back door and go hunting. Um, so a goshawk out here or a red tail out here would be wonderful. Cooper's hawks too. We have a lot of quail. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the, you know, there's English house sparrows that are attracted to all the barns and we have starlings mm -hmm. in our orchards. So we have fruit orchards and we have a vegetable garden. We have pastures and, you know, cattle and, uh, chickens and pigs and sheep and, Wow. All those things attract, you mm -hmm. know, English house sparrows and starlings and, uh, and rabbits. And so have, have you ever had to buy hawk food ever since no. you've lived here? I wouldn't <clears throat> no. think so. No, for, <laughs> you're just a you know, trap if, you know, you're in desperate need. Yeah. For the molt, I just, I go out and trap or, you know, when we trap ground squirrels that are damaging our orchards, that's, that's my molt food. Yeah. And then just perfect. put that in the freezer. So you it's get paid to trap them too, right? So yeah. It's part, <laughs> it's, it's part of the gig. Yeah. It's part of the gig. So it works out really well. I'm, I, I got really lucky with uh, being able to continue my falconry while on the farm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I used to live in Camarillo, which is like, I don't know how many miles away, 15, 10 miles away from yeah. here. As the crow and, flies. <laughs> yeah, seriously. <laughs> <laughs> and I've never uh, ran into you. And for a good reason, you know, all the hunting fields, you just walk out your door, obviously. Yeah. Because most falconers, you know where they're at. You know, they have their fields and, you know, sometimes they cross paths. But in general, you know, when you see another falconer at your field, you grit your teeth and you keep going. Yeah. But for you, you've got a pretty good setup here. So. Yeah, I got really lucky. And I, I would go into Camarillo a little bit with some of the guys that I that I knew that were hunting around here, like Tony and Joe Suffordini and mm -hmm. um, Mike Maxey and Rob Conahan and some of those guys and, and John Gunther as well, my my sponsor. Um, and so there were some duck spots that I would try to hunt in Camarillo, but there's so much pressure on them from guys flying Falcons. Um, and I really prefer, I don't know if this is going to sound strange, but I really prefer cottontail flights with a goshawk. It's just so, it's so dynamic and so aerial. And there's a lot of moves where with a, a duck fight, not to downplay it at all. Um, but it's rather direct for me. It's the same thing with a, with a jackrabbit flight with a goshawk in my experience with the goshawk, if they want the jackrabbit, they're going to catch it. Mm -hmm. Um, but with cottontail, it's like, it's a little more, they it's have to put effort match. in. Yeah. yeah. And you know, cottontail are always running into a bush or running around a bush and they put in very quickly. Mm -hmm. And so the goshawk really has to work for it. Um, so yeah, I just, i what I found was I really enjoyed hunting right outside my, my yeah. farm next door and on the farm. And the flights were a lot cooler, a lot more dynamic. Um, a lot more of a display, a lot more effort required. And so I just, I kind of stopped pursuing that gotcha. a little bit. Yeah. 
I got lucky. You filmed quite a bit of stuff. Is that all, all that stuff is filmed here except for the stuff labeled? Like I think when you went to Arizona. Yeah. Most of it was here, um, around here in Moore park and around the farm. And then, and then some of it was in Arizona. Some of it, um, was in Wyoming when I was, I was at an Eagle meet, um, with a rehab Eagle I was working with. That was Hannibal. He was, he didn't deserve the name. He was actually pretty great. <laughs> I only got nailed by him uh, once, I think once. Oh. So he, he was a pretty good Eagle actually. When how, he did would, he, how did he get you? He just popped me in the chest. I didn't, I wasn't holding his chesses and, um, mm. he just decided to like, let me know he was, he got afraid is what happened. Oh. He being a male Eagle, you wouldn't think it, but sort of like most of the male birds actually like Cooper socks and goss socks they're they're just a little more jumpy and so he was a little more afraid of me and unsure of himself and this was early on um, when I was really first kind of working with him and manning him and he he like did this out of fear and just like grabbed my chest and then let it go okay. right away thankfully yeah um, the other guys like Mike Clark and Tony Seferdini they have stories of like female golden eagles trapping them like pinning their <laughs> hand to their thigh and holding their other hand and like luckily that's never happened to me um uh. i've had very good experiences with the the rehab golden eagles i've i've worked with but they've also worked with a lot more cases and they've worked with some mal imprints or you know illegally obtained imprinted eagles that then they were working with to try to fix so they've had very different experiences than than i've had um but I forgot what the question was now because I started rambling on. It was oh, I just asked eagles. you how you actually got um, grabbed. nailed by the eagle. Yeah, yeah that's that's what happened. Um, yeah. But yeah, and and so I think it was uh, where I hunt mostly. And then one time I was at a, the Wyoming eagle meet, um, and so I have some. I think I have some footage there. Maybe I don't, but that's where Giselle caught a couple uh, white-tailed jackrabbits, which is sort of. I know I just said jackrabbits aren't fun to hunt, but uh -huh. white-tailed jackrabbits are huge. And she uh -huh. caught a couple and she, you know, flies at like 850, 860 um, when, when she needs to be motivated. And in the fields here, she'll fly at 930, 950, like 100 grams heavier when we're hunting cottontail. But when we go, if we're going somewhere and we're hunting in an unfamiliar place and she's, we're hunting something she doesn't really want to catch, then I have to dial her weight down a little bit. <laughs> but yeah, she caught two white-tailed jackrabbits up there and that was, that was kind of the highlight. Uh, of her hunting. Yeah. Um, so time. That's cool. I've, um, I watched your videos and you did a lot of imprinting videos and they're very informative from the very beginning. Like you even have some time lapses of, you know, propagation and like, uh, yeah. <laughs> reading and, you know, inseminating your bird. Like yeah. it's crazy stuff. It's really good stuff to watch, especially, I mean, you label everything as I'm not a professional. This is the first time, which is great. Mm. And, um, uh, I can only imagine, um, the comments, you know, cause in the falconry community, people always have their opinion, right. but I mean, the way you put it across, I can't see how anyone could, you know, talk down on what you did. I think that you did such good information, even if it's just a way to show you what not to do in one circumstance, but right. it looked like you did everything pretty well. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was impressed. I think I got really lucky in that all the falconers that I, sort of grew up with in terms of my falconry career, if you want to call it that. Mm -hmm. Um, and that I've been surrounded with here, John Gunther, Mike Maxey, Michael Clark, Toby Buttersworth, Tony Seferdini, Joe Seferdini. Um, all these guys have been falconers for a very long time and they have a very sort of high, um, not threshold, but they, they are very good falconers and very particular and they expect a lot. And so I wasn't, when I was with them, I learned a lot. They would point out a lot of things. And if I did something wrong, they told me. Yeah. Or or if it wasn't necessarily wrong, but it wasn't how they would do it, they would tell me. And so I, I think I just got really lucky in that the caliber of falconry that I was surrounded by mm -hmm. was much more than I would have been able to achieve if I wasn't surrounded by that. And I also rely very heavily on them. Um, when Giselle got West Nile, I think I called all of them and a veterinarian, but I called all of them first to get their opinions. When I, you know, when I run into a, a, a trouble spot that I can't figure out, I call them and they're very helpful in that way. And so I think I just have a really good community around me and I'm not afraid to ask for help. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the biggest thing. Like, I don't know if they find me annoying, <laughs> but I have no problem just texting them, <laughs> calling them and saying, I need your help. And you know, what do you think? And so I, I'm able to get these opinions from falconers that have been you know, practicing the sport of falconry for 40 plus years. Some of them, some of them started when they were 11, 12. Wow. 
Wow. Um, and they're, they're all mostly like a decade or a decade and a half older than me. So I, I got really lucky in being surrounded by Falconers with a lot more experience than I had. And, um, and I think that's what, what really helped me. And I wasn't a good Falconer in the beginning. I struggled a lot. Mm -hmm. It was very hard for me. And I didn't actually feel like a successful Falconer until Giselle and until the rehab Eagles. And then I, I flew Harris Hawks and red tails and Kestrels and some, a couple Cooper's Hawks successfully and a Sharpshin Hawk very successfully. Um, mm -hmm. but I just didn't quite feel like I belonged until, until I, you know, got Giselle was successful with an imprinted Goss Hawk. And, yeah. uh, and then I felt like, okay, I'm a Falconer now. Yeah. I feel if you're able to train and hunt an exhibitor successfully, you're a pretty gar darn good Falconer. Cause that's, pretty much one of the toughest things to do. Yeah. And, and, you know, I don't know, I, I agree. It's, it's hard to do here, especially in Southern California to fly a goss hawk where you don't have the cold weather. And so that's, that doesn't really play in as a factor. You know, when I took Giselle to Wyoming, part of the reason she caught those white tailed jackrabbits is it was cold okay. and that changes their mentality completely. Like all of a sudden the switch turns on and they're serious and you see them in a totally different mode. But down here, it never really gets cold enough yeah. for, for you to rely on that. When I was in, in Indiana, I saw the same thing. Winter is a very helpful training uh, method for a lot of passage birds that are trapped. Something about winter just changes their psyche and then they're, they're like dialed in and they're ready to go. And, and so I do think that makes it a bit of a challenge, but then also I don't have quite the variety of flying under my belt. Like I've never really flown a long wing. I mean, I've flown American kestrels, but I've never flown a prairie or a peregrine or a jeer or, you know, I flew a lantern at a bird show, just lure stooping it, but that's not the same thing as actually sure. falconry yeah. and hunting with it. And so I don't think I, I quite have, you know, that side of things too. So mm -hmm. I don't even really, I'm a master falconer because of the amount of time I've been a falconer 21 yeah. years now. Um, but I still don't really consider myself a, a master falconer. I think I'm decent at some things, but especially, you know, dirt hawking and, yeah. you know, and, and now maybe a little bit of sippeters, but I'm definitely, there's, there's guys out there that know so much more than me. Um, but I don't know, maybe I'm just selling myself short, but that's how I feel. But, and, and I think that's what helps me strive to do better. Yeah. So. Well, there's always that saying, you know, it's best to be the dumbest person in the room and learn from everyone else. So right. you have like a great core of people yeah. that helped you along. And that's kind of important for people just getting started into falconry. If you don't like your sponsor, you feel like you're, I mean, there's some sponsors out there that are just paper sponsors and, and people don't know what that means. It's just, they sign off and they, you know, if you have a question or a problem, they just say, figure it out. Right. You know, they're, they're not there to help you. So it's best to be, like you said, eager to ask for help when you need it. Um, because you know, the bird's life is always on the line. If you're new, if you don't know yeah. what you're doing, <clears throat> things can go south real quick. Yeah, definitely. So yeah, that was very, very cool that you had such a good like mentorship with such a great core group of guys. Yeah. And I, and then again, I just, I kind of just like forced myself on them yeah. <laughs> just by like bugging them constantly. So I'm just, I'm really thankful that they uh, responded, um, and you know, answer my call still. And, uh, but they're, they're a great group of guys and I, I got really lucky, I think. Yeah. Cool. Um, so I want to get into your, um, your, let's talk about Giselle, your imprinting yeah. videos. Yeah. So I so. got Giselle when she was eight days old from a breeder here. And I, you know, it was that whole thing of, I only had a week of vacation and I wasn't sure if I could, you know, find a nest, find the right age bird and do everything I wanted. So I, I said, I'm, I'm going to prepare everything because I know I'll get a bird if I buy her from a breeder mm -hmm. and she's a North American goshawk. And I got her from a local breeder at eight days old. And all I really knew was sort of the Steve Lehman-esque approach to, um, imprinting a bird, which is hand feed it every single piece of food when it's a baby, like a full on imprint. Mm -hmm. And because my background was operant conditioning and, and animal training, I really understood those concepts. And so for me, being able to use food as a training methodology was really helpful because I, it would help me shape behaviors and you know, encourage behaviors I wanted and, um, reduce, uh, behaviors I didn't want. And so for me, that was, it just worked in my brain to understand that. So I, I hand fed her every piece of food when she was a baby growing up. And, and I, I, I think I put most of this in the, in the video with her. Um, 
and, you know, exposed her to everything. But then I also hacked her, um, which, you know, in Mike McDermott's book, um, which I have both of them up there, um, he talks about how, how helpful hacking is for an imprint dissipator. I didn't really follow his recipe, though. This was, again, more the Steve Lehman type of um, imprinting methodology. And so I, I wasn't trying to hide food because I was giving it directly to her. I took her everywhere. Mm-hmm. Luckily, I was at the farm at the time, so I'd put her in the barn, and everyone would walk past her, and horses and tractors, everything was going past her. And then I hacked her on the farm, so she got to experience all of that, you know, cows and sheep and, unfortunately, chickens. Um, <laughs> and, you know, people in tractors and forklifts and bulldozers and all kinds of equipment, semis, and a lot of people. Mm-hmm. And um, then when the hack ended, I weathered her out on the farm for the first year. She was right in, like, right by the main barn. And, uh, at, you know, at that time when she was being weathered and she was young, we had about 40 employees. So there's a lot of activity Mm -hmm. and I think that really helped. And I also didn't, once we got past the actual, you know, feeding her cause she was a baby stage, then I didn't call her to the fist and then everything was pursuing things off the fist, but always going away from me. And so even in the field when she was young, you know, when we first started hunting rabbits or at least trying to, I, I would set up the remote controlled car, the RC car with the rabbit lure on it and have her chase that. And then we'd walk around for a bit and, you know, we'd kick up a live rabbit and she would go after the live rabbit and she would miss. And instead of, you know, jackpotting her for those things, I would then use my tidbits. And w- when I was walking back to the car, we would do restrained pursuit exercises, but walking away. So as we're walking back to the car, I would throw a tidbit 10 feet in front of us and she would fly after it. But she, at this point she's on the leash. Mm-hmm. And so it was always kind of like working for a meal, but never coming to me. Um, when I did have to call her to me, I would throw a tidbit on the ground instead of calling her to the fist in the, in her second year and, and on from there, then I, then I called her to the fist, but I was really worried about aggression yeah. And it was my first goshawk. It wasn't my first imprint dissipator, but it was my first goshawk. And so I wanted to avoid aggression. Um, and so I threw a tidbit on the ground to call her back, or I would use the lure if she was really far away and not responsive to the tidbit. Mm-hmm. And we did a lot of these games, but I, I took her out every single day and she chased something. And even if she didn't catch it, then I at least would, you know, would, would then get her on the, the RC car lure once I got back to the car. So there wasn't a day in her first year that we didn't hunt until her first molt. We did, we did some kind of exercise every single day to make sure her head was screwed on straight and she knew like sight picture and the way you get food is by flying away and pursuing it Mm -hmm. instead of coming to me. And I think that was maybe even more so than the way I raised her. It was, it was the hunting every single day and pursuing something every single day and chasing something every single day that really got her mind right. And, um, and I never, she's never been aggressive. I think in one of my videos, she did grab my hand once I was like making it on a rabbit. This was in the fifth or sixth season. And I was just being lazy and not caring. And she like grabbed my hand and let it go. Uh Um, but I luckily have never experienced any aggression with her when, you know, even in her muse, she's not aggressive. I sort of shaped the behavior when I walk in there to feed her that she jumps between two perches Mm-hmm. And so in order for the, for me to give her the food, she has to jump back and forth between these two perches. And, um, that's kept her from flying at me for food. So she's, she's never really flown at me for food, but I never let it happen in the first place. So I've always been sort of shaping what how did, I wanted. How did you instill that uh, behavior? How did you enforce it as far as positively? I, I started when she was young and so I'd use tidbits at first. And so when she yeah. jumped to one of those perches, I'd throw a piece down mm-hmm. on the, the other perch. And then when she went to that perch, I'd throw a piece down on the other perch. So she kind of learned to go back and forth between perches. And then she would anticipate me throwing food. So she would jump there, but before I got the piece down and then I'd throw it on the other perch. Okay. So she just learned to go back and forth. And now when I walk in there to feed her, she jumps back and forth between the perches like 15, 20 times. That's and so then cool. I'll throw the food down. Yeah, that's cool. And I, I learned that from doing, um, jump ups. I did jump ups in my bedroom at the time with one of my red tailed hawks. I had a really high vaulted ceiling. It was like a 15 foot high ceiling. Mm -hmm. And I put a perch up at the top of the ceiling. Nice. (laughs) And I had a, I had a a deflated basketball on the Uh ground covered with a carpet. Uh And I would just sit on the edge of my bed and work with this red tail to, to do 
vertical fly ups or jump ups 15 feet up to this perch. And I would just sit there like watching TV and I would just throw tidbits sort of randomly and just shape this, this red tail exercising itself in my room. And that's kind of how I learned about the whole perch thing. And, Mm -hmm. um, we did sort of a similar thing when I was working at the bird show at the LA zoo. So it was just something that came in really handy. Yeah. So in the beginning, when you got your red tail going up to the 15 foot perch, Uh were you putting tidbits up there or you were only throwing them down? Very initially I did it, but she kind of wanted to go to that perch. So what I would do is I would stand on the bed and hold her up Mm -hmm. on my fist. And that was close enough to the perch and it it had Astro turf on it. So Mm -hmm. she kind of recognized it as a perch. Yeah that she wanted to go to it when I, when I initially held her up there, then she kind of just went to it. Mm -hmm. And then I would throw food on the ground. The trick was getting her to go back up and down without landing anywhere else in the room. Cause she would like land on the curtains, Uh land on the TV. Uh And so, um, it, it was just, it took time to shape that, but eventually I would sit there like watching some dumb TV show probably. And she would be exercising herself and I would randomly throw tidbits down. Um, but I would, I would do it as she was flying up to the perch Oh, okay. to reward flying up gotcha. as opposed to flying down. Oh, okay. so it was just like a timing thing. That's great. But it worked yeah. out well. That's really cool. Yeah. I've never heard of that as far as. That's like a lazy falconry training <laughs> method right there. <laughs> I think that's uh that should be the staple as far as, you know, conditioning your bird. That sounds great. Yeah. If you have really tall ceilings, I highly recommend uh-huh. it. Yeah, <laughs> definitely do that. I also did, you know, a lot of restrained pursuits where you hold the leash and you throw food down and you walk them over to it slowly. So they're, it's almost like a flying treadmill for yeah. the bird. Um, and then I did a lot of jump ups, but with a goshawk jump ups, just, it's like not quite enough for them because it's so easy for them to go vertical. Whereas with a red tail going vertical is like, they need to have some power and stamina in them to do that. Mm -hmm. So cool. Um, now you mentioned, um, instead of jackpot, um, training, you Mm -hmm. threw the tidbits on the ground. Some people don't know what that means. Yeah. Just, could you explain? Yeah. So what I do with Giselle is I, I'll weigh her before I take her out to either train her or hunt her Mm -hmm. and I'll, I'll know exactly how much food I'm going to feed her in weight and I'll cut up the food into small like fingernail sized tidbits or bits of food, Mm -hmm. pieces of food. And uh, kind of like a dog trainer, I have a pouch and a, you know, a little like Tupperware container and I keep it in there. No, I Um, meant, I meant the jackpot. Like when you have a big, Oh, the jackpot itself. Sorry. (laughs) The jackpot is when you throw Uh, all the food down at once. Okay. Um, and so I don't do the, the jackpot thing usually. In the beginning, okay. when you're first working with a bird, the jackpot idea of, of, of giving them a full crop on something, mm-hmm. which is, that's what a jackpot is. It's a full crop. Yeah. That's, the, but jackpot is like the training way to say it. Mm-hmm. Um, in the beginning, that's very helpful to get them to understand what you want them to do. But later on, you, you sort of lose your tool of using food as a training tool if you, if you jackpot them in that way. Mm-hmm. Um, that can be disagreed with a hundred different ways, but in terms of initial training, I was using those tidbits and getting a lot of exercise out of my bird instead of like caught the rabbit crop up, go home. Like I wanted to extend my, my interaction with my birds longer. And so sometimes they would catch a rabbit and instead of cropping them up, I would give them a quarter of their meal. Mm -hmm. And then I would work with them on the way back to the car. So we would do training exercises on the way back to the car. Nice. Um, so it just, it just is a, is a way, like if you have a dog and you give it breakfast in the morning and dinner at night and you feed it all of its kibble in the morning and all of its kibble at night, what the way to imagine it is, what if you had kept those kibble with you and throughout the day, the dog got a kibble for doing something like every time it sat, it got a kibble or every time it did a behavior, it got a kibble. Mm-hmm. And what you're doing is lengthening your interaction with that dog throughout the day in that positive reinforcement way instead of just jackpotting them their breakfast and dinner for sitting, yeah, you know, for one second, you like sit, you give them the food, they eat it, it's done. Um, so I was extending that period of time working with the birds by, by using all those tidbits and not jackpotting everything at once or not giving them a full crop right away. But sometimes a full crop is very helpful. It gets the point across and that's all the bird needs to like click on and, and like the light bulb goes on and they're like, Oh yeah, I'm supposed to be hunting that. Yeah. And I just got a full crop and now I know what that is. Mm-hmm. So it's a useful tool. Sure. And not Sometimes. everybody has all day, but if you do, it's great. Right. Yeah. That yeah. too. Sometimes, especially here, you know, in the winter I get off work and it's dark in about half an hour. And so I have a half an hour to hunt 
and in that case, I'm not, I'm not tidbitting. I'm not messing around. I, like I come home, I get the bird, yeah. turn on the telemetry, get out the door, uh-huh. you catch a rabbit and it's dark, you know, by then. So there's a lot of that too. How many, um, how many heads head of game do you think you can, what's the most that you've caught in a in day? One, yeah. In one day. Um, she's caught, I think five rabbits, whatever the limit was, which I think was five rabbits. Mm-hmm. I should know that <laughs> <laughs> I'm blanking right now, but uh, that was early yeah. on. Um, and now I just, I just catch one rabbit in the fields that I'm in and I just really take my time with her. I think one of the, one of the issues I do have with her, is she's a little more protective on a kill than I would like, but there's, there's no aggression. She's just mantly and sure. mantling in and of itself. It's not horrible. Cause I have coyotes and bobcat and badger and uh, red tails galore here mm-hmm. and I don't want them to find her. So I'm okay with her mantling. Yeah. But when she catches a quail, she tends to kind of take it a little bit of a distance. Oh. I'm not usually hunting quail. I'm usually hunting rabbit. So it's not a big deal. She just drags it near a bush. Uh-huh. But what I'm realizing is if I wanted to hunt quail with her, she would probably carry. And so I've, I've stopped sort of doing multiples for a little while and I'm, I'm kind of just sticking with one and done, okay. um, but really just letting her take her time on it so that I'm hoping to kind of reduce that mantling, carrying yeah. possessive behavior. But it, I mean, I mean, it's not bad at all. And she's actually really great in the field. I, I can take 15 people in the field with me. Like in terms of goshawks, she's been maybe one of the easiest goshawks. She doesn't really like dogs because I didn't raise her with a dog. Mm-hmm. She doesn't like uh, semi trucks, um, but she doesn't go very far when she's afraid of them. She just kind of goes to a tree and pouts for a bit and then comes back. Mm-hmm. Um, but I can take a ton of people in the field with me and so she doesn't really have many vices. It doesn't matter what color hat you wear, what yeah. color clothes you wear. You can look at her or not look at her. You can stand right behind her or in front of her. It really doesn't matter. She's, mm-hmm. she's almost like a Harris hawk when we're out hunting. Um, and I, yeah, I just, I think it was the, um, I took so many people initially out with me and I was just lucky to do so, yeah. um, that she's used to all that. So she doesn't have many vices, but if she, you know, the one vice she has is she'll carry a quail if she catches it. So I've, I've been working yeah. on that, but, um, she's caught multiple crows in a day as well, four crows in a day. So she's, she, we can do multiples. I've yeah. just kind of moved away from that. Okay. Bit. Yeah. And I noticed in, um, a lot of your training videos in the very beginning, I don't know, I don't remember if you did it in the, in the middle or when you out hunting, but you had this piece of AstroTurf uh-huh. and you would use that every time to put her food on it. Yeah. What's the deal with that? That's the magic carpet. The that's, magic carpet? That's what it's called. It's called the magic okay. carpet. I did not invent this. Um, there was a couple of falconers that showed me this. I think it was, I think it was actually um, Toby and Mike that told me about it, but I know Raymond Guzman and, and that crew also uses it and have, have used it for a long time. Um, and basically it's a, it's a way to keep them from being possessive of the kill, but still be able to eat on a, like a platform. So you get a piece of AstroTurf and initially it's fairly large, so they can't drag it anywhere. Okay. And you tie a, a tiring to it. So if you're gonna give her a rabbit leg for catching a rabbit, you have the rabbit leg tied onto it. Mm-hmm. And then when the goshawk catches the rabbit, instead of transferring her to the fist and potentially dealing with any aggression that can come from that, you just put this magic carpet sort of over the rabbit in front of their feet and they grab the, the, you know, the rabbit foot or the chick, whatever you tied to the magic carpet. Mm-hmm. And then they transfer off the rabbit really easily. Okay. And then you put the rabbit in your bag. And then when they're done with the magic carpet, there's nothing to be possessive over because they usually don't get that possessive over the carpet itself. Sometimes they'll like grab it and carry it a little bit, but they don't go very far with it. And so that was just a very simple method for me um, to, to decrease possessiveness and, and have a really super easy, clean uh, trade-off from, from a kill when she catches something. And initially, uh, with red tailed hawks, w- when I first started out in my early years, I would just throw tidbits down and I was catching again, multiple rabbits a day. And I would, I would throw like a half a chick or I would, I would get English house sparrows. I would trap them and freeze them. And I would throw a half a house sparrow down mm-hmm. and they would jump right off the rabbit and eat the house sparrow. Um, but what I found with Giselle and with some of the other occipiters was the, the magic carpet just worked a little bit better. So I just carried in the bag and it's, it's pre, uh, baited Mm -hmm. with the, the food, the tiring or the, you know, the partial jackpot reward. 
and then they get that feeling of, you know, they caught something and usually they catch something, you go over and you kill it really fast. Mm -hmm. Um, and then you're, you're trying to get them off of it and they don't get the satisfaction of, you know, really tearing at it and, and getting to eat that food, Mm -hmm. especially if you're using chunks of tidbits. Like if you throw down a handful of tidbits, they eat it super fast and it's like, they're not satisfied. Sure. So yeah. tying a, a tiring or a leg or a whatever to the magic carpet gives them an opportunity to actually like rip and tear and feel like they had the full experience. They caught mm-hmm. the thing, they got to rip it and tear it yeah. and, and they feel satiated. And then they trade off and you know, they come off of that relatively easily and you put it in your bag and you continue hunting um, or you, you know, feed them up and you go home. <clears throat> nice. Um, yeah. yeah. So, um, with uh with Giselle and you were hunting um, daily, was there anything throughout your kind of documenting um, since she was your first you know North American Gossen imprint? Um, would you have done anything differently? Oh man, that's a good question. Yes, um, I think I wouldn't have rushed her off of her kills initially, but I was so focused on the multiple kills a day. Um, that it, it kind of skewed how I should have approached the multiple kills a day. Mm-hmm. I do think multiple kills helps them realize that they don't need to be possessive over this one thing because they're going to get another one. Okay. And so you can have a lot more fun, especially when your bird gets good and they catch the first rabbit up and you spent like 45 minutes getting ready and, you know, 45 minutes driving to the hunting spot. Um, this is not always my scenario, but when we hunt yeah. jackrabbits, this is what it's like. And if they catch the first one up and they're done, it's like, oh, okay, well, I guess I'm going home now. So to extend the fun you end up catching multiples. Um, but it's also catching multiples is a good way to keep them from being possessive. And when they learn that they're going to have another opportunity to hunt, it becomes easier. I think I was rushing her though. Like I wasn't giving her when she would catch a rabbit, I'd go in and, you know, kill it. And then instead of really giving her time, I'd let her, you know, pluck a little bit, the, the hair on the uh-huh. rabbit, but then I would just get in there and like get the magic carpet under her so I could get back out and get hunting. And I think that was a mistake I made. But in terms of the hand feeding and the imprinting that I did and the hacking, that was all great. I mean, hacking is, uh, that's a precarious thing because if they land on the wrong power pole, they're gone or, you know, a neighbor's dog. And I let all of our neighbors know what I was doing and to call me if anything came up. Um, And they were all pretty cool with it. But that can be a risky proposition, but there's so much benefit to hacking they really take care of their tails well. I don't have to, she doesn't jam her tail into the ground. She doesn't damage her tail on perches. I use a mang perch as well um, normally, but she's free lofted mm-hmm. in a, in kind of an open dog kennel situation. And normally that's a no, no, you, you know, you never free loft a bird with a, a wire cage. It's always, you know, plywood solid views or, you know, the, the like prison bars type of thing, yeah, exactly. the prison bar windows. Um, and she doesn't need that cause she, I think because I hacked her and she grew up with it and she got very comfortable with it. So there's a, a lot of benefits to that. So I, I wouldn't have changed that, but I also realized that imprinting the way I did a full imprint and hacking the way I did and training her the way I did is not everyone's cup of tea. And sometimes it is easier to just follow the recipe, sort of the Mike McDermott method. Not to say that that's easier because there's still a lot of involvement but you, you have a very um, succinct plan to follow. Mm-hmm. And I think that can be very helpful, especially with your first bird. What I did was because of years of past training experience, and I felt confident that I could shape behavior if I saw it coming on, that I could then avoid aggression if it popped up. Um, but again, I think the most important thing that I did do with her was I hunted with her, or we fake hunted you know, a remote-controlled car rabbit mm-hmm. every single day in her first year. So I would change how I approach her on a kill and how I kind of rushed her. Um, but other than that, I, I probably wouldn't change much. Okay. I, I, I got lucky and I, and I also like really put a lot of time into it. And I think both of those things kind of yeah. came together. The way you document it, you can tell, I mean, it was a daily effort and for yeah. you to document it added on top of that extra effort. So, yeah. you know, that was really cool. Yeah. It was a bit of a grind and I, I think I documented it because I was always reaching out to falconers to ask these questions and, mm-hmm. and you never learned that stuff unless you were with someone and saw how they did it, you know, how they trained their bird, how they picked up their bird. And so I, I think I documented it partially to, 
help me clarify in my own head what I was doing, but also because I know there's a lot of falconers out there who are wondering the actual steps to take to get to where, whatever they're trying to achieve, mm-hmm. you know, and this is very specific. This is like goshawk or Cooper's Hawk and in, in case the case of the, I've been the terrible Cooper's Hawk video. Yeah. Um, but I, I just felt that that might be helpful because those were all the questions that I had early on. Like I, I read all the books, um, but I think a video of someone really explaining it, like not to say dumbing it down per se, but explaining it step by step would have been really helpful for me. And so I thought it might be helpful just to put out there. Absolutely. I mean, we're in the day and the age of what do you do? You just type it into YouTube, honestly. I mean, right. It's yeah. the, the, qu- the cliff notes of books nowadays. Yeah. Yeah. So. It's a gr- it's a great tool. Mm-hmm. And yeah. I, I actually learn better that way too, as opposed to grinding it out right. for a week reading a book. Yeah. It sticks when I see it and then I can replay it in my mind. Yeah. And I, I, there was a lot of information that came from books and a lot of the vocabulary and all that, but watching videos is very helpful, you know, and, and, and also seeing things you would never think of or seeing someone hunt in a way that you didn't know existed or was possible, you know, Mm -hmm. um, like Mike Clark has amazing Eagle videos, black Eagle and, you know, Betty, the tank his golden Eagle, Mm -hmm. um, with his dogs. And that's, that's just flying that you just don't get to see that often. It's really amazing stuff. Yeah. Whippets. Yeah, he has, I think he has one Whippet and one Italian Greyhound, maybe. I can't remember. One is bigger than the other. Oh, okay. So I think one's a Whippet and one's an Italian Greyhound. I apologize if I get that wrong. (laughs) I mean, I used to be a dog trainer, so I should know this, but I'm Uh I'm blanking right now. Uh, And then he has a a pointer or a German short hair. No, it's a pointer, not a German short hair pointer. I might be getting that wrong too. Now I'm just sinking he's my got, own he's shit. He's got three yeah. dogs. We he's, know. he's got a bunch of videos. We you can, can watch confirm. it and, and find out. But <laughs> yeah, there's some amazing stuff out there and it's really cool to see, you know, like it was Mike Clark and Scott Timmons that originally had the Rocker Hawker videos and the road to Bakersfield and we're doing slope soaring, not to say that they were necessarily the originators of slope soaring, but them slope soaring with red tails, it was it like changed everything. It was kind of like a paradigm shift. And now Connor has those videos and yeah. some of the other guys around him. And so those are really cool to see because you get to see something you you don't know that you can do until you've seen someone do it. Mm-hmm. And so I think videos are an amazingly helpful tool for that. Absolutely. Um, now you had uh, a video on Giselle being a foster parent to a Cooper's Hawk. Yeah. Where, where did this uh, come to play? How did this come about? Yeah. So in her, in her second year Giselle was starting to show signs of getting a little breedy Mm -hmm. and I thought oh that might be fun to like learn more about and you know have her build a nest and see if she lays an egg and um and she did (laughs) and then I was like oh no (laughs) what do I do now she laid an egg Uh so I you know scrambling and calling everyone and calling the breeder I got her from and Mm -hmm. and um they were really cool really helpful and and they said yeah well you know you can come by goshawk semen and try to inseminate her and this is how you do it and so i tried and it it didn't work i i'm sure it was all my fault um and so once i knew the eggs weren't fertile i thought you know what we've gone this far i mean i i did all the you know the the couples uh things with her and you know we did the like fake copulation and i artificially inseminated her and we built the nest like we we did almost the whole process she might as well raise a baby and so I, I pulled a Cooper's Hawk and put it on my, it was a bird that I was going to use for falconry and I had her raise it mm-hmm. and she did a great job. I mean, it was, you know, it was her first time raising a baby and I helped a little bit in the beginning, but then she kind of handled it from there. And my thought with that too was, well, if she can do this, then maybe next year I'll be successful with artificial insemination and she can raise her own baby. Mm-hmm. And then it'll be like this sort of full circle, circle of life type yeah. moment, you know? And, uh, and, and so I got a Cooper's Hawk and put it under her and she raised it. And then I hacked him. This was Ivan, Ivan, the terrible. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I hacked him out. And so he hung out around the house and then, uh, and I, I made a video about his process too. And I got him hunting and we caught quail and small birds. And then I did have a carrying problem with him. Mm -hmm. Um, and he did grab me once I, I had it in the video. Um, And again, it's just, you know, like, uh, maybe I'm just not good at trading birds off of their kills. I don't know. But, um, it was the same thing where I was trying to get multiples and I was doing a lot of magic carpet and we had this one incident, but after that it was, it was fine. And 
Um, then I got really busy with work and I had a, I had Ivan, the terrible, the Cooper's Hawk, Giselle, the Goss Hawk and, uh, Hannibal, the golden Eagle. And it, it was just like too many birds for me to juggle and handle. And so, um, with getting busy with work, I ended up giving him to another falconer, but the, the process I've, you know, I filmed the process of her raising him. It was, it was really cool. It was cool to be a part of cool to experience and cool to see her do that. Yeah. And seeing then, her see the baby for the first time was really cool. Yeah. I was so nervous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I asked everyone that I knew, I was like, do you think this is going to be okay? And uh, they said, if you, you know, if you don't make it a big deal, and the Cooper's Hawk is young enough, she should, she's in that mode. She's in like mother mode and she should just take it. But be honest, if she ate the baby, would you have posted the video? No, but I was standing, <laughs> I was standing right there. Like, you know, I put the baby in there uh, and I had my phone and I was like ready to jump in. Okay. Um, yeah. And luckily I didn't need to, but I was, I was, huh. I was, I was very nervous. Um, and I didn't feed her chicks for a long time because oh, I thought, okay. well, if I'm feeding her chicks and then she sees a baby That's hawk, good but like foresight, yeah. But they know the difference. Like, I mean, I think it was good foresight, but you know, they're very extinct, instinctual. And um, one of the falconers said, make sure she can hear it peeping before she sees it, and it'll totally change her her oh, mind. Okay. One of the guys I talked to, um, and that maybe happened. I, I can't remember. It. I'd have to go back and watch the video, but she took to it, and it, and it went totally fine, and and. And, you know, and then that set her up, um, a couple of years later where she did, I artificially inseminated her. It worked mm -hmm. one fertile egg. She incubated it the whole time. I don't have an incubator, so I didn't pull it out. It was a natural incubation. She hatched it and she raised it. And then that, um, that bird went to a, a falconer locally. And, uh, I called him recently. He's had her now for almost three months and Oh, cool. And he said she's doing great. Yeah, this was this year um, that she had the baby. Wow. And, and you know, most people will tell you, you either fully imprint the bird or you have the parents raise it in a chamber and you don't mess with it. Mm -hmm. But she raised the baby and I was going in there every day. And and a lot of people told me, like, that's a bad idea. Uh -huh. And I was, and, and then I told this falconer, I said, you know, it's it's not a full imprint and it's not a parent raised bird. It's kind of like a dual imprint. I don't really know what it is. <laughs> and he said, ah, oh, that's fine. He's been a falconer a really long time. And he's like, it's fine. It'll be, it'll be fine. And she, so far she's great. That's awesome. So I'm, I'm glad it worked out well. So yeah, that's why she raised that baby Cooper's Hawk. And, and then um, she got to do the full circle of life. And mm -hmm. I don't think I'm ever going to breed her again. <laughs> really? It was a lot of work and I couldn't leave. And oh, I had to yeah. put a, you know, electric fencing around her uh, muse because raccoons and po we have so many raccoons and possums and they were coming around at night. And a couple of times when, when the baby was young, there were snakes in there and oh, she would wow. alarm call and uh -huh. I could hear it from inside my house because the muse is right next to my house. And so I'd run out there and there's a giant gopher snake in there. Yeah. <laughs> and so it was just too much stress uh -huh. and, uh, and it was a really awesome experience, but I think I'm done with that now. So and we're your, just gonna enjoy Is your things. room like right next to her muse? Almost, almost, almost. Okay. yeah. I have the eagle muse on one side of my room and then uh, her muse sort of on the other side, outside. Um, but yeah. So she, you heard everything. I heard everything that was happening at night. Oh. If she got upset, I, it was like two in the morning and I ran out there and there's a, there's a possum, <laughs> you know? Oh, so I, I had to, it was just too much. It was too much for me. I mean, it was successful and you it was were, great, uh, but. You were definitely a good, you know, Papa Goshawk protecting I'm a the good, family. I'm a good falconry dad. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a good hawk dad. Yeah, for uh -huh. sure. Yeah. That's a. That was really cool to watch and it's impressive um, that, I mean, I'm glad that it, it went as it did because you had, you know, the, the Cooper's Hawk parenting and then it kind of progressed, like you said, nicely for, you know, her to have her own baby. And right. Yeah. I'm, I'm excited. I want to keep in touch and see how, you know, was it a, a male or female that she uh, it, was, it was a female. Oh, okay. Yeah. And so, um, you know, the falconer is, um, is kind of in like the Inland Empire and it's super hot there. And it's, oh. and it's been really hot recently. And they had the, I think it was the Bobcat fire. I might be wrong about that. So he hasn't been in a place where he's like really getting out there and, and hitting the ground with her right now hunting, but, um, he's, he's been flying her and she's gotten some chases in and, you know, behavior is great. And so, so far so good. So yeah. I didn't totally ruin her with my weird <laughs> dual, dual imprint <laughs> thing. Yeah. Uh -huh. So, yeah. Well, cool. I think, um, I wouldn't be surprised if I saw you later on down the road, once you got your fill with the agricultural <laughs> stuff, I think I might see you doing some type of 
entertainment training show, maybe on your own terms. Is yeah. that possible? I, I don't know. I don't know. I'm really uh, invested in regenerative agriculture right okay. now. And so I'm, I'm kind of going more and more in that direction. Although, you know, falconry is sort of a, it's like the mistress. It's not uh -huh. the, it's the, it's a love of my life, but it's not uh -huh. the, the first love of my life. Um, right now it's like, she's so kind you, of on the back burner a little bit. Are you growing towards trying to own your own crop, um, producing farm? Yeah. I yeah. I would love to do that or get into consulting, but okay. I think this, this movement of regenerative agriculture, especially in this day and age is a really important one. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, being able to grow healthy food in a healthy way, yeah. It's healthy for the planet, healthy for the land, healthy for the people, healthy for the economy, healthy for the community, all those things. And especially in the time of COVID, mm -hmm. you know, people really want food. And Definitely. so we have not had a difficult time selling our food. We've been very lucky in that way, but mm -hmm. it kind of made you realize what's important and farming and food is very important. Absolutely. I'll put the link, I'll put the link here for you guys to see that little video because I know he's really passionate about it and it sounds interesting. I'm going to watch it myself. Yeah, so. yeah. It's the, the biggest little farm documentary and, and the farm is Apricot Lane Farms. And uh, yeah, we're doing amazing things here and, and a lot of people are all across the world now with regenerative agriculture. So that's kind of my my new love yeah. that I'm married to. Right uh, but falconry will always be there and the rehab stuff will always be there. I'm, I'm sort of an, I've always loved animals and animal training and that, that will always stick with me. Um, that's not going to go anywhere, but I think my, my pursuit and my goal and my aim right now is to really, you know, be on the, the forefront of the, the regenerative agriculture thing and, and continue that and improve that. Um, but then there'll always be falconry. Well, you have Giselle, you know, staring yeah, at you I have, through your window. I have Giselle. She's not going anywhere and she's uh -huh. great. And now it's so easy. I mean, I did, um, I did a series of videos of, of coming out of the molts and how I get her ready. And I think that's how I did it in her first and second year. But now I basically kind of lower her weight. And if she responds to the lure, we go like, okay. that's kind of it. So she's, you know, but she's going into her seventh season and, mm -hmm. um, it's old hat for her now. Sure. Do you have yeah. any, any other aspirations for Giselle, um, trying to change anything or are you just, I don't know. Dialed I, in and you're, I think I'm dialed in with her. I'm looking, you know, I'm looking for like the next challenge, which, which might be another passage Cooper's Hawk, but done differently. Mm -hmm. Um, excuse me. I, um, I have flown a couple passage Cooper's Hawks and been successful with one. And I think I got really lucky. Um, his name was Frankie. That's again, the alphabet thing. <laughs> So your sixth bird. <laughs> yeah. Well, it was, you know, there was like Annie, the red tail and Andy, the red tail. And then there was Bonnie, the red tail. And then there was a bunch of Cooper's Hawks, like Connie and Connor. Oh, okay. Um, this is, so yeah, I used the letters for male and female before I moved on. So it's been quite a few more birds than that. But okay. um, yeah, I, I think maybe a, a passage Cooper's Hawk in a different way. Cause I did the uh, strobe light thing mm -hmm. I've, and I've done, you know, traditional manning. And so I want to, I, I want to try something else with that um, and then challenge myself to something else I haven't done mm -hmm. with falconry and try another bird or another quarry. Yeah. Uh, but I, I mean, I really like Giselle. <laughs> I yeah. really like goshawks. Uh -huh. I really like eagles and, and then the Cooper's hawks have always been a challenge. So I think I'll always be pretty dialed in with that. So okay. maybe one day I'll do a Falcon, but yeah. One thing um, a lot of beginner falconers, they just don't understand or they get told, but they just don't really grasp is not every bird is meant for falconry. Sometimes it is good to release a bird. Um, in your vast experience, how many times or what, what was it that kind of led you to believe that I need to, I need to let this bird go and try again? Yeah. I, I think that only happened with me with, uh, two Cooper's Hawks mm -hmm. and it was, you know, I did, very similar things with all the Cooper's Hawks I had trained, but these two Cooper's Hawks were just not, you know, getting with the program. And there was a lot of fear mm -hmm. and it was, you know, even with the strobe light, like once I got past the strobe light stage, one of them, once it got to, you know, normal room light, um, it, it just wasn't, it wasn't clicking. It wasn't happening. And it just felt like I was not torturing the bird, but it was almost, yeah. it almost felt like that. Yeah. And, and most birds, they come along and, you know, they start coming to you and you can feel this, this sort of understanding and partnership developing. And, and then usually that blossoms into something great. And then you have a hunting partner. And with these two Cooper's Hawks, it just, it wasn't happening. They were doing the hanging baiting thing. And, oh man. 
and you know, initially they weren't, mm-hmm. um, cause I, I wasn't doing traditional manning with these two or I was just like, okay, hood off, you know, room full of light. Good luck. Mm-hmm. I didn't do that with them. Um, I did strobe light. I did, you know, dark room training mm-hmm. and, and I'm sure I probably did something wrong, but, uh, with these two, they just never came around. And so I, I cut them loose, but I cut them loose relatively early on. It was a couple weeks oh, okay. in where I was, I just, I didn't see the progression I'd seen in other birds and I, not that it was a lost cause, but it didn't feel right for the bird. Yeah. And so I think sometimes it's the training that's wrong, but sometimes there's just birds that don't fit Sure. and, and I, it's better for the bird to, to let it go and, you know, try again. Yeah. I do. I do think there's a stigma. Some falconers or even just people who have strong opinions would say it's never the bird's fault. It's the falconer's fault. Which right. I don't agree with, I, I don't, I don't see that as always the case. There's no absolutes, especially when you're training animals, mm-hmm. there's so many different variables and, um, like you did so many different approaches right there. Maybe they weren't the right approaches or maybe they weren't done a hundred percent correctly, but even so you made a judgment call and it's just better to be in the wild. It's not, it wasn't, you know, it was showing fear. It was right. you know, almost on the borderline torture, or, you know, forcing it. So I commend you for that. That's, you know, a lot of people, they don't like to talk about that stuff. You know, they, yeah. they take it as a slight or as, you know, they're not good enough as a falconer, but yeah. And it, and I think my initial, you know, when I was starting off with those red tails and those kestrels, I made so many mistakes, hundreds of mistakes, lots of mistakes. Um, and you, and you learn from that and it's, um, and that's part of the reason why my sponsor said, let it go and trap another one. And, you know, I, I know falconers that have had the same red tail for 26 years and that's great, you know, yeah. or maybe not quite 26 years, but up in the twenties. And, um, and that's an awesome relationship and awesome experience. Um, but if you are constantly training new birds, even if you don't keep them or if you keep one, but then you are still getting other ones and training them, you get to learn that aspect of it a little bit better. And every time you improve and you improve. Um, and I think you can get very comfortable. Like I'm very comfortable with Giselle. I don't, it's no effort now, really. We just kind of dial in the weight, go hunting. Um, and so you can get a little bit, uh, complacent and then there's no opportunity for improvement of your training, of your manning strategies, of your management, your, you know, your equipment building management, your, your muse design. Um, you really don't know until you've had quite a few birds and, and that can really help you dial things in. And so I, I do think it's good to do that. And, um, it's, it's all learning experience. So, yeah, I mean, if a bird's not working, maybe it was you and maybe the bird wasn't fit for it, or maybe you chose the wrong training method, whether you went strobe light, traditional manning, or, you know, you used like a uh, Pakistani, like ABBA type of thing. Like there, there's so many ways yeah. to go, you know? Um, so yeah, I, I think, the, the great thing about training and coming from an animal training background is it gives you a lot of different tools and you have a lot of different methods to try to solve a problem. Yeah. And I think that's been really helpful for me. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I want to wrap up, but I want to ask you one more uh, question. Go for it. People love to hear the pain stories. <laughs> so give me a really good one where you made a really dumb mistake and you paid the price. I want to hear something. Oh man. Okay. Well, the early on I had a, friend with me out trapping red tails. And I thought this was like four years in. And I, you know, I thought I was like the bee's knees, you know what I mean? (laughs) I'm like, I'm a general falconer now. Oh yeah. And so I wasn't being careful. We trapped this red tail when I was pulling it off of the BC, the trap, Mm -hmm. it, uh, it got me and it, like, I couldn't get it off of me (laughs) and like dug its, its hallux into my thumb bone right in the joint. And so I had to have my friend who wasn't a falconer, had no idea what was going on. It was his first time out wow. seeing a bird getting trapped. I had to have him help me get this red tail's foot off of me, this, this talon out of my thumb. So that was, uh, that was a mistake. And then, you know, that, and that was just my idiocy mm-hmm. for being so confident to just go grabbing this bird off the trap and not paying attention. And, uh, I've had a lot of those, uh, you know, I had an Eagle put its talon through my arm and, and, you know, went in here, came out here. And that's because the eagle pulled the gauntlet down and then intentionally. Uh, yeah. <laughs> or maybe unintentionally, but it's okay. like, it seemed Either intentional way, at the time. Worked out for the very eagle. smart uh-huh. eagle. Um, and it was a bald eagle mm-hmm. and it put its talon 
through here and it, and it came out the this part of my arm, the meaty part. But luckily it was a bald eagle and you know, they're strong, but not that strong. Like it wasn't a golden eagle. It wasn't an African crowned eagle. So I was able to get the talon out pretty easily, but I have a lot of those stories and they're all my fault really. Um, but in falconry itself, I, I haven't had that many experiences. Most of my like attack stories have come from, um, animals that I was training, you know, for movie or TV work or bird shows. Like, uh, a, we had a mountain lion that would lick you a couple of times and then bite you. And oh, so, really? <laughs> yeah, that happened once and I was stupid. I was like tying my shoe and he came over and he put his teeth on my head, oh, but he was young and he was kind of playing like it wasn't an attack. Mm-hmm. Um, but that was interesting. And then, uh, yeah, I got bit by an alligator and, um, where, uh, on my hand, I was, it didn't his, roll. No, he didn't. He was a smaller alligator. Luckily, oh. he was young at the time. So he was only six feet, which is mostly tail. That's like half tail, half oh. body. So it's only like yeah. a three foot body or so. It's not that big. His name was Happy. And uh, there's uh, Happy From the Happy alligator. Gilmore, yeah. The one that yeah. got the, the golfer's hand. <laughs> yeah. And it was totally my fault. I wasn't paying attention, but we would go and get him and, you know, put him on a leash and walk him around. And um, I was just, I was young and dumb. And um, I got attacked by a kinkajou. It's a kinkajou. A kinkajou is, uh, it's in the raccoon family. It kind of looks like a mix between a teddy bear and a monkey <laughs> with a prehensile tail. It's, they're adorable. Uh, okay. But they, they bite like a, you know, like a pit bull. They got jaws on them. Dang. Like a block. This guy had a block head. Do they have the canine teeth too? Like They're smaller, luckily. Okay. But he, he bit me and I, and he, you know, I couldn't get him off of me and he was just like crunching the bone <sighs> and. I couldn't bend my finger for a year and, you know, a again, year? a year. Yeah. I went to finger therapy. <laughs> <laughs> they were having me do exercises. Um, wow. and it's in a, it's in a book. Actually, I have the book here. It's called kicked, bitten and scratched, um, yeah. a year in the life of like the world's best animal training school or something like that. That's a bad <laughs> representation. Um, but this was at uh, the, the yeah. animal training school that I was who's at. A, so who's your kinkajou rehab guy? I might need to keep that. It was, it was just, it was a physical <laughs> therapist, but when I went in there and told them what happened, they also, they looked it up. They were like, what's a kinkajou? And they had uh-huh. to look it up online and see what it was. And I had a camel trample me and all, all kinds of really fun things in my animal training days. And again, mm-hmm. almost all of those things, totally my fault. And, you know, being a bit of a young idiot, but I've learned from that. And so, okay. So we went back up, back up, back up. Yeah. Camel trampled you. Did he like knock you over first? He he reared up and then he brought his two front feet on me. Yeah. And I I got lucky and and one of my teachers, he saw it happen. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, he comes running over because it looked pretty bad. Yeah. And, uh, you could die from that. You you could, they have pretty soft feet. I mean, they're very heavy, Uh but they have very cushioned padded feet. And so. He kind of like hit me and I, you know, fell and it was fine. It was, it was fine. Okay. And he was a young camel. And so we were kind of learning together. What did you do wrong <laughs> but, there? Um, I, I was just taking him, um, through a place that he wasn't comfortable with and he didn't want to go through it. And I was trying to coax so him to go through it. Of you. No. I know, <laughs> I know. Why would I choose this path with that strange uh, tractor? You know, yeah. I'm an idiot. <laughs> um, so I've had a lot of those, but you know, overall it's, it's, it, you know, Again, most of the attacks, totally my fault. And they weren't full on attacks. Like nothing's really had the intent to kill me. It's usually coming from a defensive place. And so what I've learned is, you know, you can, training is a tool, but you can only push things so far with, Mm -hmm. with animals, but it's a little bit different if you have like an imprint bird, Mm -hmm. then sometimes they're just attacking you because they're an imprint (laughs) and if you're not careful, (laughs) that can happen. Um, but yeah, with these other Mm -hmm. animals, it was just random. Situations. So, so if you're attacked by a random animal, whether it's a kinkajou, a camel, uh-huh. what's the, or even an eagle, what's the best way to respond? Are you supposed to ignore that it's happening and not show a response? Yeah. It, the best thing is to be super calm okay. and then figure out how you're going to approach it. Okay. Cause if you react too strongly, things can go very badly, very quickly. Okay. Um, I, I, at the bird show we had, you know, we had a cockatoo and he didn't like guys, but as part of the show, you would take them out there. And so you're standing on stage and you're, you're speaking to a crowd of a thousand people and he's, he's biting the hell out of your (laughs) hands and you're bleeding Uh and you just like pretend like it's not happening. And Uh you know, Scooter had a bad day and you need to work on your relationship with him and, and that kind of thing. Hmm. Um, so that's happened a couple of times. Like I was working with the bald eagles and this was early on and one of them grabbed my leg and 
you know, you just kind of play it off. And I, I think I said like, oh, you naughty eagle, <laughs> you know? And <laughs> this like, is in the show? This is, yeah, during the show. And oh, you man. get used to that sort of thing. Uh-huh. Where Because if you panic and react, then like everyone panics oh, yeah. and reacts. And, um, mm-hmm. and so, yeah, I have a very strange, people have actually told me that have seen me get attacked by an animal like I don't respond and it's it's very strange for them like it, they're uncomfortable with my non-reaction but I uh, think I've had such a lifetime of it that I just I kind of have gotten used to it and yeah overreacting isn't the way to go you gotta think your way through it yeah instead of making it worse so I don't want to like necessarily end on that tidbit of information because <laughs> there's so much other stuff there so don't get attacked by animals yeah. uh you know have fun yeah. Well, I think there is plenty more good stuff before then. You're not yeah. going to ruin it. Yeah, um, yeah. But if there is anything you want to end with, go ahead. Now's your time. If you wanted to tell, you know, speak on anything. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't know if I do. I mean, watch the videos on YouTube. They're um, maybe informative or maybe you'll very, totally disagree. Very um, informative. You like them. Yeah. And, and if you disagree, that's cool. Again, it's not for everyone. This is like a very, I was using very specific training methods that worked very well for me, but you can, you know, find that stuff on YouTube. It's just my name, Trevor Jahungard, or um, on Instagram, although I don't do that that much. And now mostly it's kind of all farming and not a whole lot of uh, falconry stuff. But um, yeah, you can you can check it all out on Facebook and YouTube. And and if you're getting into falconry, have fun with it and enjoy it. And um, don't be afraid to ask a lot of questions. It's very helpful. All right. Well, yeah. thank you, Trevor. I appreciate you giving me you know, so much insight and, you know, you've already put a lot of content out there. I'm glad that we were able to talk about a little bit more than that. Yeah. And hopefully people can see and learn from your videos and, you know, learn from this podcast too. Yeah. No problem. Been been a really good talk and you're a cool guy and I appreciate it, man. Thank you. I appreciate it.